Good morning and welcome to the 2018 Interconnection Process Enhancement Stakeholder Call for, to discuss the second amendment to the draft final proposal. My name is Jody Cross and I will be facilitating today's call. We will pause periodically for questions, so please press pound 2 on your phone to enter the queue. Please remember to state your name and your affiliation before asking your question. The presentation is available on our web, website under Stay Informed, Stakeholder Processes, Interconnection Process Enhancements. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded and is for informational and convenience purposes only. The recording will be posted on our web, website for a short time. The recordings and any related transcripts should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. With that, we'll go around the room and let you know who's here. Will Weaver from Legal. Jason Foster, Interconnection Resources. Bob Emmert, Interconnection Resources. Matt Chambers, Interconnection Resources. Linda Wright, Interconnection Resources. All right, and let's get going. So today we're going to talk, uh, we've been, we just did the introductions, we're going to go over background and scope. Um, we're going to cover the interconnection, financial security, and cost responsibility topics, and then move on to interconnection requests, acceptance, and validation criteria. And then I'll close it out with the next steps. So as you can see, as I stated, this is the second addendum to the draft final proposal. We are planning to take this to the February board, so it is um, a quite uh, a quick turnaround. And then with that, we will turn it over to Jason for the background and scope. Or, sorry, Linda. Hi, this is Linda Wright. Um, the 2018 I is um, with Proposed the general interconnection process and request changes uh, to improve our process. This is the fourth ICE that we've been through. Um, originally, we had 42 potential projects, of which 25 were included in our straw proposal. We had eight topics were found in the straw proposal, and um, we had 17 topics in our revised straw proposal. All those, all those projects have been completed except for 7.1, which we are doing today. And also we added two new topics at our last uh, stakeholder meeting, which we'll just touch lightly on today also. So we're going to turn the time over to Jason now to cover 7.1. All right. Thank you, Linda. Oh, real quick. So I'll be covering the maximum cost responsibility and network upgrade discussion, and Matt Chambers will be reviewing the interconnection or, or briefly discussing the interconnection request acceptance and validation criteria. <laughs> All right, so to kick this off, we've set it up where we review the definitions and then the framework that was proposed in the paper. We wanted to start with the definitions just to set the structure and, and uh, understanding of the term, terms and terminology that we'll be using uh, in this presentation and in the paper. So with that, uh, an assigned network upgrade is an RNU or LDNU for which the interconnection customer has a direct cost responsibility for. A conditionally assigned network upgrade, or CANU, is an RNU or LDNU where the cost responsibility is assigned to an earlier Q cluster or interconnection customer, but which may fall to the current interconnection customer or cluster. An interconnection service reliability network upgrade, uh, just a quick note that this is the same as the ISNU from the previous addendum. And we added the word reliability to add some uh, specificity to the definition. Anyhow, it's a reliability network upgrade at the point of interconnection to accomplish uh, the physical interconnection for the generator at the ISO controlled grid. Quick note, and we'll review this shortly, but can use can be identified as interconnection service. A precursor network upgrade is an upgrade that um, is assigned to the current cluster, but which the upgrade was um, assigned to an earlier cluster that has executed a GIA, or it's a network upgrade that was approved in the KAISO transmission plan. And then the definitions for cost responsibilities. The current cost responsibility is the sum of the interconnection customers allocated um, cost for assigned network upgrades and the allocated uh, ISRNUs, which we'll get to shortly. This amount will not exceed the maximum cost responsibility. 
and it is used to calculate the interconnection financial security posting requirement. The maximum cost responsibility is the lower sum of the interconnection customer's ANU costs plus 100% of the allocated ISRNU costs from its phase one or phase two studies. And these, this value can be adjusted in subsequent reassessments um, if and when a conditionally assigned network upgrade converts to an assigned network upgrade. The maximum cost exposure is the sum of the, the customer's maximum cost responsibility and the customer's conditionally assigned network upgrades from its phase one and phase two interconnection studies. Uh, we'll get into more details, but the final maximum cost exposure is established in the project's phase two study results. We received a good amount of feedback and alternative considerations from stakeholders. Um, we took all of that back to the drawing board, and uh, you know, again, we had to look at how we balance the risk between all parties. Um, and so we feel like this current proposal accomplishes that, and I'll go over some of the details of what changed now, and then we'll get into the details of the framework um, following this. So specifically, the specific items, the first one is the treatment of the conditionally assigned network upgrades. Uh, in the first addendum, we allocated 100% of the cost responsibility in phase one. In this second addendum, we adjusted that so that the can use would be assigned an allocated cost in the phase one and phase two studies. Uh, important to note that the can use identified as interconnection service network upgrades are allocated 100% of the cost responsibility. And then we are maintaining the fixed cost concept of four can use identified in the phase two study for the purpose of adjusting the maximum cost responsibility and maximum cost exposure. The second item is the treatment and definition of interconnection service reliability network upgrades. Uh, ISRNUs can be identified as allocated ISRNUs or non-allocated ISRNUs, and a percentage of those will fall within the project's current cost responsibility or maximum cost responsibility, and I'll get into the details of that uh, here shortly when we review the framework. The third item is treatment of maximum cost exposure. Uh, again, the phase two study establishes the final maximum cost exposure, and the phase one uh, MCE is, that's identified is preliminary for um, identification purposes only. And then this proposal proposes to allow adjustments to the maximum cost exposure when the maximum cost responsibility is adjusted. Uh, and, and if we recall from the first addendum, the maximum cost exposure was maintained at a higher level even when the maximum cost responsibility was adjusted downward. So we were able to find a way to make that work. And then the last, or the fourth item here is um, in the first addendum, we proposed, or the CAISO proposed to uh, shift the point at which the PTO backstops the funding of an upgrade from the execution of a GIA to the point at which a project posts its third financial security posting. Uh, we have changed that entire structure to uh, shift back to the point that a PTO would backstop that cost to a GIA execution, and the new proposal is to remove the GIA execution requirement from the TPD retention requirement. All right, the fifth item we covered uh, was headroom issues. There was a few stakeholders still concerned that uh, there was headroom um, created when CANUs convert to ANUs or some other scenarios with between CANUs or ANUs, and we wanted to ensure and, and uh, assure everybody that there are no headroom issues created within this proposal. Um, I guess to be clear and transparent, though, that uh, as it exists today in current practice, um, assigned network upgrades can create headroom for other assigned network upgrades within the project's maximum cost responsibility or, or 
case current cost responsibility. Uh, stakeholders um, had some questions and concerns about funding conditionally assigned network upgrades or precursor network upgrades in order to achieve an earlier commercial operation date. Uh, these are really two separate issues, so I'll, I'll cover them separately. Uh, conditionally assigned network upgrades are, are upgrades that do not have an executed GIA to them, and therefore there's no party that's responsible for constructing those upgrades at this point. Uh, it's in, so therefore, uh, the, a later cluster project with an identified CANU who would like to achieve a COD earlier um, and build that conditionally assigned network upgrade must fund that upgrade uh, at the time they wish to proceed to construction or post their third financial security posting. Then separately, a precursor network upgrade is an upgrade that has an executed GIA from a previous cluster. And uh, in this situation, if a later cluster project would like to proceed um, or, or have that upgrade uh, developed earlier, it must pay the acceleration costs of that upgrade to achieve an earlier COD. They're not funding the upgrade, just the acceleration costs. The next item is the RNU reimbursement cap impacts from a conditionally assigned network upgrade conversion to an a, uh, assigned network upgrade. The, uh, just to be frank and clear and direct, the RNU cost will impact the reimbursement cap when a CANU is converted to an ANU. Um, you know, it's, it's considered an RNU when it becomes assigned to the project and it will fall within that reimbursement cap or the, the, uh, total re the total RNU cost for the project. And then lastly, there were stakeholders that uh, requested the CAISO to review uh, an, an opportunity for an additional RNU reimbursement when later CUBE projects utilize a previously developed RNU that exceeded their reimbursement cap. Uh, the CAISO, so some history on this, the CAISO looked at this in the original development of the Git app. Uh, I apparently spent some time um, hashing out how this could be uh, developed and tracked and monitored and developed going forward, and it, it apparently was extremely complex and therefore it was not implemented uh, at the time. Um, Therefore, fast forward to today, we, we do not have time to review this item in the scope of the 2018 IPE process, and we will not be including that um, in this paper. All right. So a picture says a thousand words. We, we felt it better to include this chart and then talk through uh, the framework and how it's structured and, and how it will play out. So I'll do that now. So upgrades, and, and I'll, just for the sake of viewers who are looking at the live PowerPoint or um, the screen share, I, I will be using the mouse to uh, track along with what I'm saying verbally. So interconnection customers are assigned uh, assigned network upgrades and conditionally assigned network upgrades, and either of those can be, be uh, also they're assigned interconnection service reliability network upgrades. So ANUs here are in blue, conditionally assigned network upgrades are in orange, and interconnection service reliability network upgrades are in green. Here we can see the separation between allocated ISRNUs and non-allocated ISRNUs, um, and I'll get to the details here shortly. So cost allocations for assigned network upgrades will continue to follow uh, current tariff provisions in Appendix DD, Sections 8.3 for RNUs. Uh, that includes short circuit related impacts and for LDNU flow impact section 8.4 of appendix DD. I'm gonna jump up to conditionally assigned network upgrades. Again, the phase one and phase two uh, studies will also follow appendix DD sections 8.3 and 8.4 for cost allocations. Um, and then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, conditionally assigned network upgrades that are identified as interconnection service network upgrades will be allocated 100% of that upgrade's cost responsibility uh, within the CANU section here. 
two things can occur with conditionally assigned network upgrades in subsequent reassessments. The first is they can be removed from a project's responsibility. Uh, and this can happen really one of two ways, right? It can be simply no longer needed for the project, or it can become a precursor network upgrade when at least one prior cluster executes a GIA for that network upgrade. Um, when a conditionally assigned network upgrade is removed from a project's responsibility, the maximum cost exposure would be reduced by that fixed cost of that upgrade in the phase two study results, um, and the MCR would remain unchanged. Uh, I, have, I have examples following this chart that will better depict uh, what that scenario looks like. So the second thing that can happen when, to a conditionally assigned network upgrade uh, is that it can become an assigned network upgrade and be reallocated to the project, or reallocated within the project's responsibility, I should say it that way. When a CANU converts to an ANU, the maximum cost responsibility uh, and current cost responsibility increased based on that fixed cost amount in the phase two study. And again, I, there's scenarios here shortly that will depict that, that situation. The cost allocations for interconnection service reliability network upgrades, um, Projects are assigned 100% of a, an ISR and use cost within the project's maximum cost exposure. Uh, this includes can use that are identified as RS and use or uh, ISN R and use that are assigned to the project. Again, just to be very specific, uh, ISR and use are identified as allocated or non-allocated. The allocated ISR and use are those, is that percentage of the upgrade that's allocated to the project, and the non-allocated ISR and use is that portion that is not directly allocated to the project, and it's included within the maximum cost responsibility. So looking at the cost responsibility structure, um, just kind of you know, verbalizing what you see on the screen here, the current cost responsibility in phase one is made up of the assigned network upgrades from phase one and the percentage of ISR and use that are allocated to the project uh, to create that CCR. The maximum cost responsibility, again, is the assigned network upgrades plus the plus the sum of 100% of the allocated cost for uh, all ISRN use. The maximum cost exposure is established by the sum of the maximum cost responsibility plus any assigned, plus the sum of any con assigned, conditionally assigned network upgrades. And one last note on financial security postings. Uh, projects would only be required to post financial secure, interconnection financial security for the amount that falls within the current cost responsibility. Again, that's the assigned network upgrades and that percentage of the interconnection service reliability network upgrades. Okay. All right. We'll take questions now. So please post pound two to enter the queue. Um, we'll take the first caller, please. Oh, hi. This is Susan Schneider from Youth Consulting. Can you hear me? Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, I just had a couple of clarifying questions. Would you mind going to um, slide 11? Okay. Um, the, uh, the the idea of the fixed cost concept for for CANUs and the uh, third bullet in the first category. Um, I think we had talked earlier about in an earlier call about the fact that if the timing was changed for that um, for that CANU, that possibly there could be um, inflation or, or other adjustments to the cost. Are you are you basically saying here it's going to be a fixed cost, or is it still possible that 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 cost would be adjusted? So the the fixed cost concept is 
uh, purely for the purpose of adjusting the maximum cost responsibility or the maximum cost exposure at a later date when either that can you is removed from the project or becomes an assigned network upgrade. So, so then additionally to that, if when the conditionally assigned network upgrade becomes an assigned network upgrade, the project is allocated the actual cost of that upgrade at that time, well, it, just the same as any assessment would, would assign the cost of an upgrade within okay, the maximum so cost so, responsibility. Okay, so now we're not talking actual, we're still talking estimated, and I think, and um, and what you're saying is that, that um, it could be adjusted, let's say it's, it's needed, but it's not needed for now two years later because the prior projects dropped, whoever signed it dropped out. Would, would there be an escalation to the cost amount or uh, potentially or could there be? So specific to the can you, if it, if it remains a conditionally assigned network upgrade, there would be no adjustment to that. It would continue to be identified at that fixed cost from the phase two study. There may be an identification within any, any subsequent reassessment that says, here's your actual assignment, but for the purposes of adjusting the maximum cost responsibility and maximum cost exposure, uh, that fixed cost would remain the same. So again, then if that uh, can you is converted to an ANU, then the allocated cost would become part of the project's assigned network upgrade costs within the maximum cost responsibility. Okay, I guess I'm a little confused by that, that I answer. Is it that the cost will stay the same, the actual cost, the total cost of the upgrade, and it will stay the same in the maximum cost exposure, but somehow it could be adjusted for timing in the reassessment? I just wasn't sure I understood your, your answer. I'm sorry. Do I try? So, Susan, this is Bob. Um, for purposes of the MCR, the, the cost will stay the same, and I believe this is the way it works out, but if uh, – Either a project changes its COD. Uh, in that case, uh, if the costs go up due to uh, inflated costs, building the project at a later time, that becomes the customer's cost responsibility, but it's still within the MCR. Um, if, if another project, uh, all the initial projects that triggered the upgrade withdraw and the later cluster projects need it at a later date, again, it's I think it's the same issue where uh, it does not impact the MCR, but it could become uh, a cost responsibility through uh, reallocation and reassessment. Okay, my, my experience is that when a project adjusted COD, adjusted COD, the PTO often will also try and adjust the MCR for inflation as well. Are you saying that's not going to happen? No, I was saying that would happen. It just it would happen. Okay. Well, as far as the MCR, um, yeah, I guess uh, I. I I'd have to defer to the engineers on that one, and we don't have one in the room. So uh, we'll, we'll double check that one and get back to you. Okay, that would be great. And then if you could go to slide 12, I had a question about the, um, the, the second major bullet there, which talks about funding the candidates or PNUs to achieve the earlier COD. So the, cur the current provision in for this, um, I've forgotten which, uh, which tariff provision it is right now, 14.2.2 or something like that in GAP, but I think it, requires the PTOs, if someone needs to, uh, an upgrade earlier, to, put, to do its best, provide best or, excuse me, reasonable efforts to accelerate it, and only if those reasonable efforts, and it's, I think that's defined as maybe no more costs, I've forgotten, but um, only then if there's additional efforts to accelerate, that's what the customer would have to pay. So are you proposing to keep that kind of the same as it is now, only include, the, say, uh, DNUs, because right now I think it only talks about uh, upgrades for COD, well, let me back up. Okay, this talks about upgrades for COD, but I think we've also talked about upgrades that were needed for deliverability. And and so are you proposing, before I even get to the sub bullets, are you proposing that this would also be revised to include DNUs and not just upgrades for COD? Yeah, so these would be any upgrades, reliability or deliverability or delivery. Okay. Yeah, to be clear, okay. we're not, we're not making any changes whatsoever to the areas uh, that are already defined in the tariff for projects that um, where the upgrade is has a, a GIA uh, executed for a prior mm -hmm. cluster and the project okay. wants to accelerate. We're not doing anything to that tariff language at all. Yeah. Okay. Other than really you need to include DNUs, right? 
I'm you sorry, said to expand that language. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, please repeat your question. Okay, so are you, but I think for even the upgrades where there is an, an, uh, uh, an executed GIA, you are going to expand that to include DNUs, though, right? It only, right now it only talks about upgrades to achieve COD earlier, not deliverability. Yeah, we're, we're not planning to uh, make any changes to that tariff section. So you're not going to expand it to include DNUs? I'm sorry, I thought you just said you would. No, uh, we weren't, we're not planning to make any adjustments to that tariff section. Okay, that seems different from the discussion before, but let me ask you another question then. If a, if a, if a project has, has, wants an, an acceleration of an upgrade and there's no executed GIA and they agree to fund the upgrade, but then later one of the projects that actually was assigned it uh, executes a GIA, would they be off the hook? Is the later project off the hook? How, did, how are you going to adjust that? Yeah, we would we'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis, but if, uh, if an earlier queued project did end up executing the GIA and then made its third posting, uh, we would credit back the later queued project that was accelerating the project. Okay, so they have to make a third posting also, not just execute a GIA? Because they'd originally executed just the GIA, now in the new proposal, then the later project wouldn't have to fund it. So I just want to make sure we understood the question, right? So you meant okay. that the previous cluster would have to post uh, the third financial security posting or just execute the GIA? That's your question? Well, yeah, okay, so cluster, let's just call it cluster one gets assigned this upgrade and cluster two needs the upgrade and they need it sooner. Okay, so a cluster two project, one or more cluster two projects say, okay, I will pay, I'll fund this because you don't have an executed GIA for anything from cluster one. So they they fund it and, you know, put up security and start funding it. And then then someone in cluster, a project in cluster one executes a GIA. Well, if they had executed the GIA first, the cluster two projects wouldn't have been on the hook at all for it. Um, but became, because it came later, is it still assigned to cluster one and therefore cluster two gets its, uh, for lack of a better term, money back? Or is cluster, is because cluster two's agreed to fund it or somebody in there, cluster one doesn't have to anymore? How, how does that work? So, Susan, I think uh, we were having a little bit of sidebar here while you are talking, so I'm not sure we captured every part of your question, but in essence, we would need that third posting from the prior queued cluster uh, in order to have the funds to reimburse the later project that originally funded the upgrade. Okay, so the third post, you would actually take the security out of the third posting, or excuse me, the funds out of the third posting and sort of cash that in to pay the project. That's kind that, of the thinking. We haven't worked through, through every implementation uh, component or, or aspect of this, but that's what I'm thinking at this point. Okay, because you have security, but you wouldn't really have funds unless you liquidated the security. Well, if it's been constructed at that point, then um, right. then those funds need to be uh, available for that use. Okay, I'll if try to turn something in and writing uh, that makes it clear. So if somebody signs a GIA and someone has made posting for it but no construction has occurred, no costs have been occurred, then we would actually be able to just reduce their posting amount. So it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. We'd have to see how it plays out in each individual circumstance. Okay. Okay. All right. Those are all my questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Susan. All right. We'll take the next caller, please. Hi, this is Madeline Lager with Transco Energy. Can you hear me? Hi, Madeline. Hi, great. Yeah, I have a question on um, uh, slide 13. And my question's about the um, how you have the non-allocated ISRNUs. Um, so when you say that 100% assigned ISRNUs, 
and use are in the matching cost responsibility. Are you speaking to the allocated plus the non-allocated is the 100% assigned ISR and use? That's correct. Okay. And then second question on that is, is why is that not in the, in the conditional network upgrade category versus um, having it be part of your maximum cost responsibility? What's the thinking behind that? Yeah, so a conditionally assigned network upgrade can be identified as an interconnection service reliability network upgrade, but that, that upgrade that's identified as a can you is the responsibility of a previous cluster. So we kept it, we, we would keep that specific upgrade as a can you until it's converted to the project or the current cluster's assignment, at which point we would then uh, allocate it to the project um, in a percentage basis on allocated and non-allocated, and then it would fall within the current cost responsibility or maximum cost responsibility. Yeah, I guess my, I have, my question on that is, how is that different than any other RNU that when you're a part of a cluster, you get a percentage of a particular upgrade? Um, so I, I take it these are things like switch yards. Is about the only category I can think of that you're that you're separating this from other types of RNUs. Typically, yes. Yeah, okay. it's either a new switchyard or an expanded substation. Okay, where well, it's clearly not already allocated by a percentage of the cluster that it's already in. Right. See, the, the idea here is these type of upgrades are needed. <clears throat> excuse me, whether there are four projects participating in that upgrade or, or only one. In, in these cases, if a new substation is needed for one project or five projects, um, we want to make sure that there's a, a room under the maximum cost responsibility if by the time the substation gets built, there's only one project remaining that needs it. Okay. I, I think I understand that. I, I think well, my concern is that you know, if all the projects in the cluster stay, that this actually does, you know, we talked about increasing the headroom, that this has a potential for increasing the headroom for other RNUs to basically fill that gap, um, uh, which is why so, it seems like it's... Mm -hmm. it, so, let's, yeah, let's break that down really quick. So, the in the situation on the show it in the example. Um, yeah, we, so we do show it in the examples here shortly, so hopefully I'll, I'll be specific on it when we get to the examples. Uh, let me explain it really quick, though. So let's, on the screen, on page 13 here, we can see that we have a, a let's call it a 25% allocation to the allocated ISRNUs, and we'll call it 75% for the non-allocated ISRNUs. 100% becomes with it, is, is identified within the maximum cost responsibility, and the customer only posts financial security for that amount that's allocated to the project. So we jump to phase two of this project, or yeah, phase two of this project, and we can see that now uh, uh, two of the four projects have withdrawn, um, and there's two remaining, you know, this project and one other, and, and each project is allocated 50% of this upgrade. So there's really, I wouldn't call it headroom. I would say that it's, it's being reallocated into the current cost responsibility from the, the gap between current and maximum cost responsibility. It's not creating headroom within or, or adjusting the maximum cost responsibility. It's just being reallocated to the project uh, accordingly. And, and hopefully, okay. like I said, I, there's, Three examples, or there's a few examples following this that might um, clarify some of that, and I'll try and touch on it as we go through it. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for that. And then just one other question on that, though, is the um, the calculation of the allocated ISRNUs, I, I don't know if you covered that in this presentation or not, I didn't see it. Um, it looked to be in the proposal that you were, you know, how are you planning on allocating these RS? ISR and use. And the reason I ask is because somehow, you know, there's the RNU application for non reimbursable RNUs, which is based on a dollar per megawatt. And so when you come back to how you're going to be allocating these ISR and use to the project, and they're not part of the CANUs, um, uh, well, ultimately they're still an RNU, 
Um, how are you allocating those to each project? So ISR and use are allocated to projects uh, in an equal share based on the cluster. So if there's four projects in the cluster that are sharing this upgrade, each project would have uh, an equal share of 25%. So if the project was 20 megawatts or a project was 300 megawatts for that same interconnection into a switchyard, that switchyard cost is gonna be split evenly among them? That's correct. That's how it's done today for plan of service upgrades under, under the current terminology. Right, and I think what we've seen is, um, and from my experience, a lot of those are equal anyway, and I think uh, this may be an area you want to reconsider um, because it, because of the, you know, non-reimbursable network upgrade um, provisions where they're limited by a dollar per megawatt, I think you're going to find that it's disadvantaging some projects and benefiting other projects in an inappropriate manner. It should most likely be done more on a dollar per megawatt so that it can be reimbursable in appropriate manners. Yeah, I understand your point. We'll take that back as a view item. Um, I guess our, our response to that would be, again, like Bob just mentioned, the, this upgrade or ISR and use are needed whether there's one or four projects, regardless of megawatt size. So, you know, it could be a, a one megawatt project or a thousand megawatt project or a total of anything in between there. And um, the reason they're allocated on a percentage basis is for that reason. And so, again, we'll take it back. We'll yeah, yeah that. I, I can um, see that. I mean, I, I can understand that completely, but I think, yeah, you want to, might want to consider it, especially the inequality that gets generated with the reimbursement methodology. Um, but but thank okay. you. I understand. Yeah, we'll take that into consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, next caller, please. Hi, good afternoon. This is a Fernando Cornejo with FCE. Uh, Jason, I had a question on uh, slide 11, uh, bullet four. Yeah, uh, okay. the last question, the last bullet there where you're proposing now to remove the GI execution from the uh, TPD retention requirement as it relates or associated with the uh, milestones for PTO to some of the backstop uh, obligation. Uh, FCE was uh, very pleased to see that uh, the Kaiso was, uh, from our perspective, moving in the right direction under the Addendum One, where they were we were proposing to have the uh, trigger for the or the, the milestone be the third international financial security uh, to be the point in time when the PTO uh, after that point in time would assume any uh, financial obligations for new network upgrades as a result of a previously uh, a prior uh, customer withdrawing. But now in this addendum two, it looks like you guys have backslipped a bit. Uh, you're, you're proposing to uh, do two things here, and it really is a little bit, uh, I guess, inconsistent. You, you, you're trying to uh, pre appreciate the efforts to try to come up with a compromise position. Here I don't really see the compromise where uh, you are eliminating the uh, GI execution from the TPT retention requirement. Those were obviously well thought and developed during the previous uh, uh, the GDAP initiative and uh, the, one of the three main criteria for obviously for the retention of that TTD, uh, uh, the deliverability was, you know, the, the licensing, permitting, uh, GIA, and some kind of a financing. So now what this would do is, in essence, make it easier for a developer to, uh, for lack of better terms, hoard uh, available deliverability for a project that may be not be as viable as another project that can use that deliverability that's moved further along in its development. And then at the same time, you're just maintaining the status quo for the, um, the, the execution of the GIA for the PTO to assume the backstop. So I don't really see, I guess, any compromise in the change from uh, the first addendum to the second addendum. And then second of all, I think that this proposal will exacerbate a bad situation by, in essence, allowing a developer to retain criteria in an easier fashion while not really giving up or making any changes from the uh, financing obligations for needed upgrades. Just wanted to kind of get your perspective on this. Yeah, hi, Bob. Yeah, um, well, one thing that we discovered is with the, the process that we have now where a couple of years ago we implemented a procedure to where typically a generation interconnection agreement would be executed 
kind of in a just-in-time manner to be able to meet the longest lead time network upgrade required for a project. And so that actually pushed back the signing of most GIAs, which really turned out to be in conflict with having a, a, a project that gets an allocation have to sign their GIA earlier in order to retain that allocation. And we didn't really feel there was enough value in having a project sign a GIA earlier just to retain their TPD allocation. And we felt by moving this process to where um, kind of we think it is more of a, a, a substantial compromise uh, to where we take it out of the TPD retention criteria, the signing of the GIA, and move it back to when the upgrade is actually, you know, signed the GIA closer to the time the upgrade uh, design and construction really is needed, which is much more closer to the third posting. So the execution of the GIA and the third posting should be much closer together to where we think that actually accomplishes what we were trying to propose before. Okay, well, I appreciate that explanation, but I, I just think that by unraveling uh, the one of the three critical criteria for the retention of TBD to accomplish this, uh, you're assuming, and I, I appreciate the explanation on the longest lead time, the network upgrade being needed, uh, factoring into the timeline for the execution of GIA, I recall that, but I guess you're, you're, you're trying to accomplish the same goal without being explicit and making it uh, identifying it specifically with the uh, execution, or excuse me, the post of the third international financial security. That's assuming that they completely, uh, there's some uh, symmetry or some alignment between that uh, uh, time that the GI is executed and when that uh, third IFS is actually going to be required in, in, in the calculation of the longest lead time network upgrade. So, yeah. I, mean, I, I just, I guess, I guess, I mean, if the goal yeah, is to, to really, I mean, from our perspective, is if you're the real goal is to align it with the third interconnection financial security, why not just go ahead and say that rather than coming about in an indirect way and saying it's going to be, you know, make, let's, make, let's keep it where you have it upon execution of GIA and you hope that that truly does align in the just in time scenarios that you described, which cannot, in some instances cannot be, the, it cannot not always be true in all scenarios. Okay, well, uh, Fernando, if you could elaborate that in your comments, we'd appreciate that. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep it in consideration. I just wanted to point that out. Thanks, Bob, appreciate the, the time here. Thank you. All right, we'll take the next caller. Is uh, Gary Holdsworth on SCE. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I wanted to circle back with something I heard you discuss with Susan, and that was the whole idea that, you know, for accelerating network upgrades, uh, you know, the, for some of for uh, that were required by an earlier queued generator but had not signed a GIA. Um, and then you, they're worried about, well, what happens when they sign the GIA? The GIA that that earlier queued project may sign may or may not have the same COD uh, re requirement as the one that's trying to move it forward or accelerate. So just because you get a signed GIA by that earlier queued party doesn't necessarily mean that the the, dead, the timelines are going to be any change. So you may still have the, the later queued party accelerating those upgrades. Is that, is that a possibility as well? Yeah, that is a possibility, and that is actually covered by the tariff as, as it is now. And as we discussed with Susan, it, um, those costs to accelerate the construct design and construction of the uh, upgrade would become the responsibility of the later queued project that needs it earlier. Right. So, you know, that's another reason why you're arguing, I think, that on a case-by-case -case basis, you'll have to look at all those parameters to determine what you do in this situation. It's not just an automatic that that yeah. earlier queued party that gets in a GIA is all of a sudden going to take responsibility for those upgrades. That's all I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, and then I guess I'm tag teaming a little bit with Fernando. 
Um, and, and I'm sure we'll put this in our comments, but it seemed like um, we were we were a little put back by the backtrack on the trigger point for those upgrades. Uh, definitely helps that we have the CANU and the ANU very much outlined now as far as you know as far as that goes. But you're still in a situation where if you have a would draw of a party with a signed GIA at usually the, le the worst possible time, which is right before they start construction, that's when, um, you know, we have a potential uh, backstop financing responsibility that, you know, the PTOs have to take and we're willing to take to uh, make this work. But it, it seems like, uh, you know, I think it, I'm just repeating what, what Fernando said, but it seems like we were uh, seeing some movement in a positive direction for benefits that were that you would have the the GIA in place or the excuse me the the trigger point in place at the time well well down the road where you know you're going to be constructing actual upgrades you know to the point where security is going the third security posting is going to be required and you know you've received at least most of your permits or other things that hold up these upgrades being built that we felt was the appropriate spot not just at the signing of GIA so you know I think we lost that benefit in this process and I'm just a little disappointed in that I guess that's my comment thanks <clears throat> thank you Gary all right, and no other questions. No further comments. All right, let's walk through some of these examples then. <clears throat> so on page 14, you're looking at the slides. Um, this is a, an example of how the um, upgrades are assigned to the project and how the cost responsibilities are structured within the phase one and phase two studies. So I'll walk through phase one and then through phase two. So, yep. and then looking at the upgrades that are assigned for this project in phase one, we see that there's two assigned network upgrades with a sum of seven million. There is one interconnection service reliability network upgrade. This is a, an allocated, um, a, a percent allocated for that one upgrade to allocated and non-allocated. And there are two conditionally assigned network upgrades uh, identified for this project. In phase one, we can see that the current cost responsibility is established by the sum of the ANUs identified plus the percent allocated to the, uh, the cost of the allocated ISRNU um, of two million. So establishing a nine million current cost responsibility. The maximum cost responsibility is the sum of the ANUs of the seven million and 100% of the ISRNU cost of six million here establishing a, an MCR of 13 million. The maximum cost exposure identified in phase one here is 20 million. That's the $13 million maximum cost responsibility plus the $7 million conditionally assigned network upgrades, uh, again, totaling $20 million. Uh, okay, so jumping into phase two, we can see that the um, ANU2 has doubled in cost, uh, assuming here that one of the other projects has withdrawn and, and this project now has 100% cost allocation. Um, we can see that it's still assigned to assigned network upgrades. We can see an allocation adjustment for this one interconnection service reliability network upgrade, and we can see some cost adjustments in the conditionally assigned network upgrades. So. Establishing the cost responsibilities here, the current cost responsibility identified in phase two is the lower sum of the ANUs between phase one and phase two. So we can see here that the sum of the ANUs in phase one is lower than the sum of phase two. So we'll, we'll take the seven million plus the allocated cost of the ISRNU of $3 million. Uh, uh, yeah, of $3 million. So seven plus three equals the 10 to establish the current cost responsibility. The maximum cost responsibility is established by 
the same calculation, the lower sum of the ANUs plus the allocated ISRNU is plus 100% of the ISRNU. So it's the seven plus this total six million here to establish the MCR at 13 million. The side bubble here identifies that the assigned upgrades are above the maximum cost responsibility and those costs would fall to the PTO um, when the project is built. So moving to the maximum cost exposure, we can see that the, uh, the total conditionally assigned network upgrades here are identified at $10 million. And so the MCE is established by the uh, sum of the maximum cost responsibility plus the assigned, conditionally assigned network upgrades in the phase two study uh, for a total now of a $23 million um, maximum cost exposure. Um, a quick note here that the, again, and we'll see how this plays out here in the next couple items, but this phase two study uh, establishes the fixed cost for these conditionally assigned network upgrades, and we'll see how they adjust the MCR and the MCE, MCE here shortly. Uh, what do you think? Good questions. Okay. Good questions on this one. I think it's worthwhile. Oh, do, is there any questions? Yeah. No questions. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the last note here is um, we see that there, the $4 million here is the increase of ANU2 is caused by the increase of ANU2. And again, if all of these upgrades end up being required by the project at the time of construction, this cost, again, would be $4 million. Okay. Thank you. Example two, uh, so we have 2A and 2B. Example 2A uh, is a situation where the conditionally assigned network upgrade becomes an assigned network upgrade. And I, I won't go through each one of the cost responsibility calculations, but I'll just show how the cost responsibility and the uh, um, adjustments are made within the reassessment. So again, we can see that Conditionally assigned network upgrade number one, the dark orange with a value of $6 million was, is now assigned to, to the project as an assigned network upgrade. It has converted to the cost responsibility at the same value, the fixed cost that was identified in the phase two study. Uh, subsequently, that, that uh, conversion has caused the current cost responsibility to increase by an equal amount of that upgrade in the phase two study, again, 10 to 16 million, and same with the maximum cost responsibility, 13 million now to 19 million. And uh, just a key note here that the maximum cost exposure remains unchanged. Uh, that, that allocation is just adjusted within the project's responsibility. It was not removed. Uh, so then example 2B, uh, we have a situation where that conditionally assigned network upgrade number one is removed from the project responsibility. So again, I'll just explain the, the result of the reassessment study here. Because that cost responsibility was removed, uh, sorry, because that CANU was removed from the cost responsibility, we can see an adjustment of the maximum cost exposure from 23 million to 17, which is a, a, an amount equal to the fixed cost identified in the phase two study. The result of this identifies or shows also that the maximum cost responsibility and the current cost responsibility remain unchanged. I'll pause here. Is there any questions in queue? Not yet? Okay, good. All right. So here we show a pretty complex situation over several reassessments um, and then one pretty extreme example of a new ANU being identified uh, in the last reassessment. Um, there's a lot going on here. We understand that this can be extremely complex, um, and it may be complex for today's scenario, but we will have to wait and see what the future holds for us. So I'll walk through this again, starting at phase one, um, and then we'll, we'll walk through each reassessment, identify what's happening and the result of each uh, maximum cost responsibility or maximum cost exposure. So actually, again, in phase one, this is the same as the previous example. I won't, I won't go through this total calculations here, uh, but we see that the CCR, the current cost responsibility is established at 9 million, maximum cost responsibility at 13, and the maximum cost exposure is identified at 20 million. 
Uh, again, in, in phase two, um, actually the same situation. We have the current cost responsibility being identified as the, the lower sum of ANUs, which is the seven million plus the allocated uh, ISRNU of three million, totaling 10. The maximum cost responsibility being the lower sum of ANUs, which is seven, plus the 100% allocation of the ISRNUs, totaling uh, 13 million. Then we have a total of $10 million in conditionally assigned network upgrades, and so establishing the maximum cost exposure for the project is <clears throat> the maximum cost responsibility plus that $10 million of conditionally assigned network upgrades, which of course equals $23 million. All right, so jumping into reassessment one, a few things happen here. We see that uh, conditionally, uh, yeah, conditionally assigned network upgrade number one is allocated to the project as an assigned network upgrade. This increases the cost responsibility, like the previous example, to 16 million, the maximum cost responsibility to 19 million, uh, and we note here that the MCE remains unchanged. All right, in reassessment two, uh, again, we have a few other things occurring. We see that the assigned network upgrade number one is removed from the project responsibility, as well as the ANU three uh, um, upgrade being removed from the project's responsibility. So this causes two adjustments. Uh, the first being um, uh, the first being the adjustment of the current cost responsibility and the maximum cost responsibility. Because two ANUs were removed, we see that the uh, that, actually I take that back. Um, I'm going to start at the top with the maximum cost. Uh, responsibility reduction. So because two ANUs were removed, um, we see that this reduction was a total of $9 million. So in this reassessment, uh, Appendix DD Section 7.4 would come into play where we now identify the maximum cost responsibility by the sum of the ANUs and 100% cost of the ISR and U's, establishing that at uh, $14 million. So the current cost responsibility is still the sum of the assigned ANUs and the allocated ISRNUs, in this case being $11 million. Uh, as previously noted, we did allow adjustments to the maximum cost exposure, which in this case is the sum of the ANUs, 100% of the ISRNUs, and the remaining conditionally assigned network upgrades for a total maximum cost exposure now of $18 million. Okay, and moving on to reassessment three, we see the situation where we have uh, the, the final conditionally assigned network upgrade being converted to an assigned network upgrade at a fixed cost of that amount identified in the phase two study, so that $4 million. And we also see now that all previous projects have, that were assigned this ISRNU have withdrawn, and the, the current project has 100% cost allocation for that ISRNU. Again, the, a new assigned network upgrade was identified for this project uh, in reassessment three, and the result of that is the current cost responsibility, the maximum cost responsibility, and the maximum cost exposure are pushed up to that maximum cost exposure identified in the phase two study, uh, and any costs that are identified above that maximum cost exposure are borne by the PTO. Okay, so just a quick note back on the assigned network upgrade. Uh, there was a few questions from stakeholders in this on, on how this could occur. Um, you know, real generically, it, it would be a, would have been caused by a system change um, where oops, where uh, either either a TPP upgrade was uh, removed and now becomes the responsibility of the project, or some other type of system change that may occur. You want to add anything to that? Yeah, just, just wanted to clarify, this is a very rare circumstance, but we did put it into this example just to show how these kind of things can play out, but um, typically major system changes that have occurred that actually have increased network upgrades or, or brought in a new network upgrade that has not previously 
uh, been uh, shown in a study for a particular project. Um, easiest example is when songs retired and some projects that were interconnecting to that area needed an additional network upgrade uh, to be able to deal with some voltage issues that were that came up due to the retirement of songs. So that's the kind of new network upgrade or system changes that would require a new network upgrade that could actually become the cost responsibility of a project. Yeah, thank you. All right, and that's all the explanation that I had with the examples. Jody, is there any final questions? As a reminder, you can press pound two on your phone to enter the queue. Uh, currently, we do not have any additional questions. All right, we'll move on. I'll pass the baton to Matt Chambers. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, so we received fewer comments on this one. Uh, these are two new topics that were added in the first addendum to the draft final proposal. And uh, the proposals were aimed at improving and clarifying the process for reviewing interconnection request submittals uh, during the post application window and also validating the information in each request uh, to make sure the cluster is ready to enter the phase one studies. Um, we received comments and support, a request for clarification on uh, interconnection requests being deemed complete versus uh, deemed valid. And uh, we uh, also received a request for a revision uh, to add some specificity to the slots required. Um, the proposal has not changed except for that last revision. So, so here on the next page, um, so the additional item there is the second from the bottom. Um, there was a bit of detail added. So there's a plot showing flat run and uh, bump test. Uh, so the fault it bus uh, needs to be able to clear from uh, within four to six cycles. Um, for an application to be deemed complete, all of the items here need to be received before the close of the cluster application window. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so this slide here hasn't changed. Um, one item I wanted to point out there is at the end of the timeline on June 30th, um, that's the end of the IR validation period. Uh, that's when we would begin phase one studies. And so that's it, that period between um, April 15th or whatever day that uh, the ISO informs uh, interconnection customers of their package being complete. Uh, through the end of that day, that's all the interconnection request validation period where we're going through a, a more detailed review of the interconnection request to make sure that um, all the information is there to form uh, the basis for the phase one studies. That's all I have. And, and Bob, just to be clear, um, since everybody was in support of this item in the previous paper, uh, we did not make any changes and, and we consider this item to be complete. All right, then we'll go to the next step. Um, as you can see, stakeholder comments are due January 11th. Um, as we had stated earlier, we want to take this to the February board, and the board in February is at the beginning, which is why there's such a quick turnaround. Um, please turn your comments into initiative comments at kaisers.com, and feel free to email us um, with any additional questions. Um, we do have one caller, um, so just as a reminder, press pound two to enter the queue. We'll take the call. Yes, hi. This is Madeline Major at Tranco Energy again. Sorry, I think I was um, just stunned when you finished your presentation on the uh, maximum cost <laughs> numbers. I did an amazing job. Um, very clear and well done. Um, I do have a question actually uh, on another earlier point, but um, I do appreciate this complex explanation. Um, I, I think just one comment is that the maximum cost responsibility or exposure was in the earlier IPE was one of the key benefits of having, you know, the lower the phase one or phase two done so that developers can make plans at least financially on how the projects are going to uh, move forward where this this pretty much removes quite a bit of that that cap, um, especially your last piece, although I, I understand that it's rare and kind of a rare circumstance. 
Um, but my question actually is back on um, slide 12. And this has a little bit to do with kind of the questions I had earlier on how you allocated um, the um, ISRNUs to the project. So on page 12 where you talked about, you know, you made a comment, um, I know we put in comments about discussing the potential reimbursement uh, for later two projects, you know, above the um, reimbursable amount. And just a question, I'm hoping maybe the right person's in the room to answer this question is, what, on the foundation of the 60,000 megawatt reimbursement amount, can you talk just briefly about what, where, where did that number derive from um, that, that, you know, and I understand the point of, you don't want projects to develop where the, the RNUs are excessive for a very small project or they're just excessive for a project. And that makes a lot of sense, there's a price signal. But um, that, those figures, um, does anyone have an idea where those came from? And, and I, I, I'm thinking they're from ISRNU type of facilities, but um, I'd just like to better understand that. Yeah, this is Bob at Mellon. Um, back when we developed the Git app, uh, and, and implemented that particular component of, uh, of Appendix DD. Uh, we looked at a lot of projects that were had gone through the cluster interconnection process and required deliverability or reliability network upgrades. And what were the costs of those? And and there was uh, just looking at the numbers. It wasn't something that I was part of the team that actually developed, but um, just recalling the process. Uh, there was basically kind of a dividing line of, of costs that got around the 60,000 per megawatt level, and then a number of uh, projects that were significantly higher than that level. And uh, I don't remember, or I wasn't really involved specifically in this, but the idea behind it was uh, we really felt that there were uh, a group of pro or projects that typically had interconnection costs that were that we thought were pretty reasonable uh, compared to other projects that needed extensive new reliability network upgrades to interconnect regardless of their size. And uh, the decision was made that uh, we felt ratepayers really should be um, fully paying for costs that we thought were on the more reasonable side, but one uh, project was interconnecting to an area that had very limited uh, infrastructure already built that was requiring uh, large upgrades that those uh, the inter or that the um, ratepayers shouldn't be saddled with a project that is choosing a location to interconnect that required a significant amount of infrastructure regardless of their size. So that's how we got generally to that sixty thousand dollar number. Um, and, and I'll just remind everybody on the call that. We are, have filed with FERC to um, increase uh, the cost of that 60000 based on uh, actual costs uh, due to inflation. So um, we just have been going through those costs recently. We, we've got the handy Whitman cost indices from 2012 forward, and that's what we'll be indexing those costs forward from. And, and there'll be, I think, around 68,500 is, is kind of our preliminary look at it at this point, how the, the uh, new cost that those uh, uh, cost cap would increase to. All right, thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, looking backwards um, at participating in that, you know, it made sense. And I think when, when you know, the developers looking at it, we basically took switchyard costs or maybe a, a local line reconductor or towers that were needed for a project and kind of assumed um, something similar but with actual dollars. And it made sense, you know, if you're a large enough project to, to justify a brand new $21 million switchyard, you know, you usually had to have a couple projects at a couple hundred megawatts apiece or 400 megawatts. And so it made a lot of sense. And I think the concern I have is, is in listening to the the new cost structure and how your cost cap can increase, you know, justifiably if you have an ISR in you and you all of a sudden have to take 100% responsibility for it, that's always made sense. Um, but now with these costs and the cost exposure potentially increasing significantly, um, I still think it might be worthwhile to looking at a position where if later projects come online 
utilize all those RNUs that were constructed by a prior cluster that, and, you know, paid, paid direct costs towards that, that there be some version of, of reimbursement for it, kind of based on the same um, kind of calculations. Uh, but it just seems like, you know, we've, we've lost that cost cap um, certainty, uh, which makes it that much more difficult to uh, basically sell a project, right, because you don't really have cap costs. Um, so it's just more of a comment that, so, you know, if there's any way to reconsider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I kind of I understand what you're saying versus the R&U cost cap. Uh, just related to the overall cost, now that we're, we have an MCE, just want to really be clear on that in that currently within the study reports that projects get, we, we deal with this, but it's in a manner that's really not covered by the tariff as well as we would like it to be. So this is not really something new. It's just a matter of we are defining it and describing the process much more thoroughly in the tariff than it is right now. So projects are already having to deal with these uh, um, potential costs that could come up from network upgrades that at the point the, uh, in time that the phase two studies come out, they're not actually assigned to that cluster group yet, but the potential is there to, to have that happen. And that is described in study reports and the costs are uh, documented in the study reports of what these costs could actually increase too. So, you know, in reality, that situation is already in play. It's just not described as thoroughly as we would like to see it in the tariff. Right, right, and I appreciate that. I understand that, um, you know, and especially in these later clusters when we're still building on top of a lot of, of megawatts of projects and, and deliverability, it's uh, completely understandable. Um, just looking backwards in time and, and balancing the, um, you know, the reimbursement funding versus the reimbursement that comes with, you know, building network upgrades that become used and useful. So um, I understand, I, and I appreciate your consideration of looking at how you're applying the ISRMU values because we do see that in our reports and present that to folks and it makes it look like there's a lot more cost in the project than it really is. So I appreciate your looking into that. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there are no additional comments or questions in the queue. So with that, I will thank you for your time today and we look forward to your comments and have a great afternoon. All right, Keegan. Thank you to our speakers and thank you all the items for joining us today. The call is concluded. You may now disconnect.